Uh, my name is Rich Rinaldi. I'm our Director of Academic Outreach for uh, the Project Management Institute's Delaware Valley Chapter. Uh, glad to see everyone today um, for our uh, presentation and panel discussion on bringing real world projects into the classroom. We're really excited about it. Um, we're really excited to uh, get, get back to these regular meetings and uh, hope for a really good discussion today. Uh, we will hope for a good panel discussion, although we've got some questions, but we know we'll have a good presentation because we've got Barbara Cullis doing that presentation. Um, we uh, are going to get started here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what PMI DVC can do for your students. Um, so we're going to start with um, a bit of a, a commercial from Ken, who's our VP of Education here. Um, we're going to hear from Barbara, and then we're going to go right into the panel. Um, uh, so without further ado, let's, um, uh, let's go ahead and turn it over to Ken, who's our VP of Education. Thank you, Rich. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> and before I talk about students, I'm going to uh, actually talk about uh, an opportunity for some of you. Uh, to become uh, an instructor for the chapter. Uh, we are an authorized uh, training partner, so which means we can teach exam prep courses, and the chapter will uh, provide the required training. Uh, we also teach several other courses. Uh, in order to do that, you have to be PMP certified and a member of the chapter. We prefer someone who has current or previous experience teaching project management but that's not a hard requirement. If you're interested, contact me. That's my email. Um, I'll also put it in the chat. And if you look at participants, I, I put it next to my name. So um, pretty easy to get hold of. So what can PMI do for your students? It can save them money. Um, free download of the pen book guide and 10 additional guides, including uh, the Agile Practice Guide, which is really hot. A uh, big one for college students is the $75 discount on CAPM, which if they've taken a course in project management, uh, they're certainly uh, qualified to, to sit for. Um, access to PMI content on projectmanagement.com. Um, besides the webinars, which are great for getting PDUs, there's over a thousand tools and templates. And for someone who's starting out, um, if they end up someplace where there's not a large PMO with lots of tools and templates that can be extremely valuable and make them uh, look like a real genius to come up with all kinds of cool templates. Uh, the chapter, we do a lot for the students, at least we try to. We have uh, some student-oriented webinars and programs. I will talk about projects in your future in a minute. Um, in more detail, we have a mentorship program where we compare students with a working project manager to get advice and, and share ideas, uh, particularly on how to enter the job market um, and things like that that are of interest to students. Uh, they get, as I mentioned, a discount on the CAPM prep course. Uh, oh, I did not mention that on our CAPM prep course that the chapter teaches and uh, free study groups for the CAPM exam, and I understand these study groups are really great. They go over and discuss questions and uh, test-taking strategies. I think one of the biggest things for a student is the networking available at all of our chapter events, which for students are free or deeply discounted. Of course, lately in the virtual world, they've all been free. That will be changing as we move into the fall. Uh, as, and get back to in person. But for students, once again, they will be deeply discounted uh, or free, uh, where they can meet members, uh, engage with professionals, and do networking. Project Bytes is, actually it's available to all members, of course, but there's hundreds of short videos on project management and other uh, leadership topics. Uh, we have some good volunteer opportunities. Uh, often re some of them reach out to uh, younger students, which is kind of great. We like to have uh, college students involved with our, our outreach in the K-12 world uh, where they can interact with, with uh, students younger than themselves. 
then they get student PMI and chapter membership for only $37 a year. Uh, if you need to learn more about this, once again, just reach out to me. I can give you uh, more details than you probably want to hear. Come on. So I mentioned Projects in Your Future, which is a presentation for students about the arc of a project management career. It's really based on uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, you know, project management career as the hero's journey. And it's really targeted for college students who are taken or who have taken a course in project management. Uh, and we will bring it to your class. We will bring it to your school virtually or in person in the fall. Uh, just contact me. Once again, my email is up there. I have a slide from that presentation, uh, which is kind of typical of what the presentation is. So I asked this group of project managers, uh, you know, in your first year of working, did you think you could, you would become a project manager? It was always my dream to become a project manager. Absolutely not. I never thought I would move into project management. Not really. I did not think I would become a project manager at that point. No, not really. I did not. No, I never really knew much about project management when I started. No, it never crossed my mind. I had no thoughts of being a project manager at that point. I had some idea that uh, somewhere down the line, I have to take up a project manager role as, as and when I grow professionally. OK, well, thank you for listening to this uh, and watching that. Uh, and there's the poll. So please uh, take the poll, and then we will move on to the rest of the meeting. All right. We have uh, 11 of people who have participated so far. If you haven't answered, answer. <laughs> All right. Well, it was someone's dream to be a project manager from early on, which I guess is pretty rare, Ken, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I, I, I interviewed uh, 11 project managers, and one, one said that. Um, Uh, we have a higher percentage here of uh, a little bit more than half thought maybe at some point they'd be a project manager, which is larger than my previous sample. And five said absolutely not, and I certainly fell into that absolutely not category myself. So, Me all too. right, well, thank everyone for uh, participating in that, and I will now hand it off, uh, Rich. It's yeah. Well, thanks, Ken. And I, you know, I just want to emphasize, Ken is really um, the uh, engine behind the education division of PMI DVC. So you can see that there's a lot going on, and there's also a lot of ways to get involved. So he's really great about um, engaging folks who want to be engaged, and we appreciate you, you know, being here and wanting to be engaged. So please reach out if you want to be engaged on the academic side. Certainly reach out to me. Uh, Ken is great about corralling volunteers as well. So, you know, please just uh, let us know. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to uh, introduce Barbara Cullis, um, who's uh, an MBA, PMP, and uh, certified Scrum Master. So I don't know if we talk about that on PMI-related calls, but I, I am too. So I guess we can a little bit. Barb, thanks for, thanks for being here. She has a career that has spanned over 30 years in the pr public and private sectors. We sent out the full bio, but just some highlights um, that she has uh, done a lot of uh, project management for the private sector. And then more recently led university-wide projects at Penn State um, and, and implemented technology as the director of IT for the Learner College of Business. She was directed, uh, appointed to the faculty in 2016 there uh, taught undergraduate, graduate, and professional development courses in project management, IT project management, and enterprise architecture. Um, and she also led the Global Enterprise Technology Immersion Internship and Management Information Systems Senior Capstone Program for the Learner College. I think you'll hear a lot about that today. Um, I'll turn it over to Barb without further ado. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Rich. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I think everyone can see my PowerPoint at this point. Okay, sharing my screen. I'm going to uh, talk today about um, my teaching philosophy, 
And then bringing industry into the classroom and where I find subject matter experts, and then give an overview of the MIS capstone program, which has just been an, an amazing experience for me. I've had the good um, fortune to be able to both administer and teach in that program at the University of Delaware. Okay, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Okay, so my teaching philosophy is really founded in the fact that I was a practitioner in industry. And so I think about what skills would I hire? And those are the skills I focus on when I teach. And so my courses tend to be all be applied. And there's a very strong emphasis on teamwork and casework from industry. Uh, while we do need individual assessments, they're typically offered in the form of reflection papers and quizzes. I personally cannot stand exams for my classes. Um, they just don't make sense to me because students memorize things and then regurgitate the facts and forget them. Uh, everything is as hands-on as possible and I'm always providing those project management best practice templates so my students can take them and start applying them either in the workplace after they graduate because the capstone is offered uh, the spring semester of their last year in college. And my graduate courses are often attended by um, people who are continuing their education in the, in the region who are professionals, maybe mid-level and taking classes at night or professional development. Um, again, always offered at night for uh, people working in the area. And so industry experts are always invited into the classroom. Um, they typically bring lectures, casework, and I ask them to give feedback and follow up on the cases that we do. So it's not like they just come in and kind of walk away at the end of an hour. Um, I do have an expectation of them engaging the students. And then, of course, um, I'm always looking for uh, clients to serve um, my capstone class. And that's a whole different ball game. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, so bringing industry into the classroom, how do you find those SMEs? Um, and the answer is it depends, like so many things in project management. Again, my professional development and graduate school classes have different requirements than that capstone course. So in academia, a fantastic partner, especially at the University of Delaware has been career services. So at UD, career services exist at both the college level and at the university level. And our career services director has just been awesome, Jill Ponte. She's in constant touch with all the recruiters in the region who want to hire our students. And those recruiters are so competitive and they want reach into the classroom so they could find the best students before their competitors do. And so they are more than happy to go into their organizations and find the SMEs that I need for my classes. So for example, um, Ernest & Young or Price Waterhouse Keeper, um, KPMG all recruit from the Learner College of Business. And it's very easy and simple for me to reach out to those um, college recruiters and say, hey, PwC, we need a subject matter expert um, in IT implementation, who can you send? Or in project management, who can you send? and um, they'll connect me with the right resources within their organizations. So if you're looking for a starting point, career services is a great opportunity. Okay, collaborative agreements is also another great opportunity since we're a research institution. Uh, the University of Delaware has agreements with many uh, organizations throughout the region for research, special projects and so forth. And if you can find the point of contact for those collaborative agreements. Again, they are more than happy to find the subject matter expert that you're looking for to bring them into the classroom. Okay, so for example, um, at the University of Delaware, we have a collaborative agreement with between the College of Business, the College of Engineering and JP Morgan Chase. And for my enterprise architecture class, I reached out to JP Morgan and to this particular point of contact um, and ask them if they would please bring someone who could speak to enterprise architecture uh, in my class. And what they did, they went above and beyond. They sent three data center engineers to my class. They put together a lecture, 
that put together a case which served as a mini project for my class. Um, the class had to do a dentist data center layout as their project. And then they reviewed all the submissions and gave feedback to each team. So um, it was an awesome experience. And they came back year after year doing the same presentation and case. So again, um, reaching out to that point of contact, uh, it was another simple way to find a subject matter expert. Okay, and of course, the Office of Alumni or Development are always in touch and reaching out with alumni. Very often, they don't want to donate money, especially if they're recent grads, but they're more than happy to donate their time. Um, there's also executives out there who may be approaching mid or late career and thinking that they want to dabble in teaching when they retire. Those are great people to bring into the classroom or to have sponsored projects because they're looking for opportunities to engage with the students as well. So there are oh so many ways to reach out and find these contacts. Now for the capstone class, um, that's roughly 130 students and 30 teams. And so I need a much larger breadth of projects for that class. And I will get into more detail about it, but I do a lot of community outreach to support um, the capstone. And so I reach out to the professional organizations. I go to places where there are a lot of businesses coming together. So when the chamber has events, um, the Small Business and Development Council has been a very strong uh, partner Tech Impact, Technology Forum of Delaware, or Delaware Difference Makers, which brings together nonprofits. Um, I'll go and get on their agenda and do one minute presentations about the program, you know, at a breakfast meeting, at a lunch, an evening event, networking events. Occasionally I'll have a table at an event, um, but it's very, very easy to um, find very strategic ways to get the word out there about the program and just network and meet a lot of people. Okay, and of course, social media. So the Learner College of Business has a communications department who is very active on social, social media and they put the word out there as well. So when you're offering uh, student teams to organizations to help them solve problems, it's not a tough sell. We typically get more requests for projects than we have teams available. Okay, so the MIS capstone started about 35 years ago by um, a very forward thinking faculty person, Dr. Ernie Saniga in learners uh, operations program. And uh, he created this wonderful sustainable program that's been running all of these years. Um, it's modified and certainly I drove some changes, um, but um, again, it's, it, it's been running for 35 years and um, he did an amazing job booting this up. So the program is required for all MIS management information systems majors, minors, and information systems students from the College of Engineering. So it's a six credit program. Three of those credits are for project management concepts and three credits are for delivering that value adding project to a client. It runs every spring semester. And again, this is the last semester for those students. It's just before they graduate. So it really does prep them for going out into the workplace. The number of students has ranged anywhere from 125 up to 160. We're actually now in a bubble of 160 because during the pandemic, when students were working from home, they took advantage of having more time and they took more online classes and are graduating early. So that created this early graduation bubble. And next year, we expect the numbers to come back down closer to 125 again. So the number of teams might range anywhere from 28 to, I would say, even 35 right now. Um, we typically have four to five students on a team. And for those in academia know that there is a course reduction uh, for the program director. So the person who administers this program um, has a reduced teaching load because there's so many moving parts to it. Um, a teaching load, for those of you not in academia, a teaching load typically um, at UD is four courses in the spring and four uh, in the fall semester. 
So that teaching load is reduced to a, a two, three teaching load. So you have more free time to handle all the moving parts, do all the client outreach and administer the program overall. Okay, so we focus on creating business value, certainly for our clients. Um, and we teach the students how to measure business value. Okay? The students are also expected to learn how to do research. Right? They need to research their opportunity. How is this problem perhaps handled out in industry? Okay? They need to manage this project from start to finish and deliver it by the end of the semester. Um, and that's a challenge in itself. But they learn very quickly how to function as a team collaboration skills, conflict management skills, and certainly how to be a professional. So what I really love about this program is that at the start of the semester, the students are deer in the headlights. They know that they're gonna meet this client week one. They have no idea what's gonna happen. But by the end of the semester, when they implement their project and they do their final presentation, they stand up there and they are so articulate and knowledgeable about this project. And their project artifacts and the deliverables, they, they have grown immensely and now look like young professionals and are ready to enter the workforce. Okay, so there are six contact hours per week, which is a big advantage to this. Um, so we meet Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 2.30 to 4.30. And so Mondays, the student receives their lectures on project management best practices and technology topics. On Wednesdays, every team meets with a faculty mentor. And this is critical. This is where they really um, focus on keeping their project on track because they review all their um, project artifacts and their schedules with their mentors. And then the mentors help them identify any roadblocks. Sometimes they have roadblocks and they don't even know it um, because they're just learning. But um, having that collaboration one on one with an experienced faculty person um, really makes a big difference. And then Friday's block of time is reserved for client time. So they can either meet with their clients online via Zoom or go to the client site. So, right, oh well, now, now we're back in the classroom and so things are happening live again. But during the pandemic, um, everything was online um, prior to the pandemic. Again, students were traveling to client sites. Um, that was a switch, but students were able and clients to make that switch without uh, missing a beat. Okay, so a little bit more about logistics. Um, it, I have the good fortune of being able to address the students during the fall semester in a prerequisite SDLC class. So this class is required. So all 130 students are in this class and I can go and talk to them about expectations for the spring. And we actually have the students um, begin the project initiation process by the end of the fall semester. So we can hit the ground running week one of the spring semester. So during the fall, sometime right after Thanksgiving break, I go into their classroom and they sign an ethics agreement and a confidentiality agreement. We take this very, very seriously because when these students go into these businesses and nonprofits, they are exposed to proprietary information. And so I do literally put the fear of God into them as much as I possibly can um, about confidentiality. Um, after I collect all 130 ethics and confidentiality agreements, I will then at that time open up the bank of projects that I have available to them. And students can read through them all and select their top five picks and their bottom five picks. So we guarantee that when the faculty make the teams that they will not be on a bottom five pick. We make every effort to get them on a top five pick. And I'd say we have about a 95% success rate at getting students on their top five, sometimes 100%, it depends. If there's a project that has to do with puppies or a winery in the region, then so many students apply for those projects. Um, otherwise, we have a more normal distribution and we can get them on the top five. Um, but faculty will assemble the teams before the fall semester breaks. And I will say that we don't release 
the team assignments until after our January break and just before the spring semester starts. And that's because there are clients who will drop out during the January break for whatever reason. Some, a small business may go out of business. Um, we had one client who gave us a project and then they executed that project during the winter break. And so then they didn't have a project anymore. So there is some reshuffling that happens during January. And rather than have the teams get excited and start researching their clients um, early, we have them wait. And then we have things firmed up just before the start of the semester. Um, there's also addition, additional security checks that need to happen for some teams. We've had teams work in the state government, in the judiciary, um, in the Delaware State Treasurer's Office. And so uh, for some of these projects, um, clients required background checks and fingerprinting for the teams. And so they know that at the time that they sign up for the projects and we get that preparatory work done again during the January break. So it's nice to have that extra time um, to get all that work done. So before I had took, taken over the program, all of this work was done the first couple of weeks of the semester. And I would say that out of a 15 week semester, we were losing three weeks to just administrative setup. And uh, as you can imagine, 15 weeks is not a long time to run through a project life cycle. So I kind of pulled all that administrative out of the first three weeks and moved it back to the fall. So that was a huge improvement in the program in our ability to have time to execute. Okay, so faculty do collaborate on the topics uh, between SDLC and the project management courses to make sure our content is, is correct. And so um, I'll give feedback to the SDLC uh, faculty and say, hey, we need agile concepts introduced. So, you know, more and more projects are going to be agile or hybrid. So we introduced agile about eight years ago into the program. And we collaborate year over year just to make sure everything is fresh. Okay, so managing student and client expectations is, is a big challenge. So again, with the students, um, security and confidentiality are confidentiality are of the utmost importance. Um, we actually had an unintentional security breach a few years ago, and it was not the fault of the students. They were working for the state and someone from the state sent them a file that had private information in it. And that file should have been redacted before it was sent. But as soon as we realized what happened, we deleted the file, we redacted all of our reports. Um, the state launched this investigation and I was so worried that something might happen or somebody would lose their job, but um, it really was unintentional. It was a mistake on the part of one state employee. And so uh, it ended up um, not being a big issue. But one day I was actually driving to work and listening to the local news. And on the local news, I heard a report about a team in the Learner College of Business who had a was involved in a security breach uh, with the state of Delaware, and I was mortified as I listened to the radio. And all they said was that it was under investigation and then nothing else really happened after that. The students graduated um, and the state continued as is. Um, but the students do take the role of consulting project managers and we focus on uh, customer service, again, security, um, I make sure that they're on time, that they travel together when they're going to client sites. So one's not lost and their rest are waiting on them. Um, and we make sure we equip them again with all the tools that they need to do their job. So they have a whole suite of project management templates that we walk them through throughout the semester. Um, we have them prepare scripts for when they meet with their clients. So they are prepared. And um, again, those templates are things that they can take away and use. Um, in their day-to-day -day jobs. Okay. So managing client expectations um, is also extremely important. Um, I have a lot of coffee meetings with uh, clients before the workday begins when I can get their you know, uh, time and focus. 
So we've actually had clients in the past who signed up to do a project, they launch their project, and then they go off on a cruise for a month. Okay? So we had to reset expectations so they take it a little bit more seriously because we look for clients to engage. And so I would meet as the administrator with every single prospective client, lay out the requirements, lay out the timeline of the semester, um, make sure that we're reviewing the scope of the project, that it's a project that can be completed within the constraints of a semester, and that it's creating measurable value for the client as well. Okay, so we expect the clients to be good sponsors, good mentors, attend weekly team meetings with the students, and be on time with information they need to provide to the students to keep the project on track. We also require they attend a, men, a mandatory launch event the first week of the classes. And I'll, I'll get to more about that here in just a, a couple minutes. So here's what um, a typical semester might look like. We begin in February, again, we have a January session, and run through uh, May. The semester actually ends around May uh, 15th, but we target the first week in May just in case there's any uh, loose ends that need to be cleaned up at the end of the project. But we, we walk everyone through um, this project life cycle. So from conception through project closeout, again, February through May 7th is very, very tight. And then we kick off and students are executing all project management um, best practice processes, creating artifacts, we do expect them to define multiple alternatives to solve their business or problem or opportunity. And then they put together a proposal presentation. And this is a formal stand-up presentation that they as project management consultants will present to their clients. And they need to make a recommendation as to which alternative is the best and why. And then once the client negotiates the solution with them, they go ahead and hit the ground running with execution and implementation. And then at the end of the semester, they do a final presentation where they talk about everything that they've learned and celebrate all of their hard work. And I will say at the end of this, it's a very intense process. Um, many of the clients and the students do develop long and lasting Relationships. We've had former students end up on boards of some of the nonprofits in the area. Um, some have resulted in job offers. And um, we have had students who come back and now actually participate in the program as sponsors. I also want to mention, because this is important, that students are required to write learning journals every week throughout this um, process. So we look for them to document their aha moments because unless they stop and reflect, they're always running and they don't absorb the lessons learned. And that's extremely important in experiential learning. So here, I just wanted to toss up some of the sample projects and who our clients are. Um, and these are all qualified uh, businesses and nonprofits that have given us permission to use their names. Um, J.P. Morgan, again, because of their collaborative agreement with um, the University of Delaware has been an extraordinary sponsor um, to, for me and all of my classes and for this program. But the state of Delaware, the judiciary, um, whether it's churches, um, companies that are construction companies like Tri-State Underground, um, the Spirit is a bilingual school in the area, Nerd It Now is um, a computer repair service. IKO is manufacturing. Tech Forum is a professional membership organization. Uh, Mid County Center is a senior center. We do a lot of work for all the senior centers around Newcastle County. Um, Epic is an amazing nonprofit. Farmers Famous Fish is a, a food truck who wanted to implement online ordering. And then HREA is a real estate firm. And the students implemented um, a document management system for them. So the projects really vary. Um, MIS students are not developers, but they're excellent at manipulating data and doing analysis and solving problems using tools. And so even where we did website development, we were using templates and tools 
uh, not coding them from the ground up. So I just want to qualify that. But you'll see a lot of data visualization or system implementations. And these are typically off the shelf systems that they find that are suitable for uh, small businesses. Okay, so this program um, does did have a very small budget and it still does have a very small operating budget. So when I took it over, um, there were maybe, it was maybe $2,500 and that money was used for funding a client orientation the first week of the semester. So again, a lot of that administrative work was done during week one and two, and I had pulled that back um, to the fall semester. And originally only clients and faculty attended this orientation. And I was astounded by that because it made no sense to me having run projects in industry that we were excluding the core team, which is the students. So the, the core team was not hearing what the sponsor was hearing. And that right there is a big project management no-no. So I had it in my mind and I had all these grand ideas of making sure I was gonna pull together all of the stakeholders, right? And have the students attend this event with their clients They would come together, have a working session, kick off and all would be right with the world. Um, but now I was taking this event from what was originally maybe 40 people to 250 people when you bring in all the students. So it was a much larger event. And of course, the cost was going to be much higher. And as you all know, there's never any money. Now, we do charge for projects. Um, and it's a sliding scale. It's not much money that we generate. But this money was uh, designated for paying for student expenses for their projects. So our fees range from zero for nonprofits up to $500 for large businesses. And if anyone balked at having to pay anything at all, then I reminded them that the hourly rate might be 18 to 89 cents for 40 hours worth of, week, worth of work during a week. So you might have four students on a project working 10 hours a week uh, for 14 weeks and it's 560 hours. So it didn't really cost them very much. Unfortunately, there was not enough money for me to have my um, event and implement my grand ideas. So I was still very frustrated. So I had to figure out a way to get money to support this new launch. So I came up with the idea of having sponsorships. And I decided I would put together gold, silver, and bronze level sponsorships. And I would go out and hit all the companies in the area because there's so many. And we have so many opportunities. And so now I had to be careful because as a faculty person, um, I had to be careful about what I was offering. It had to be things that are within my control. And this is only for one class, really. So. Um, I had to be really careful about what I was offering. So I said, okay, companies, for $10,000, you can be a keynote speaker at this kickoff event. And you can have a table in the lobby of Clayton Hall at our conference center. Um, we'll publish your name on all of the you know, event materials. And you'll have the ability to network with MIS faculty, um, other local business owners, and then, you know, 166 students. And then I will also give you the privilege of coming to one of my classes and being a guest speaker. Because when you think about what their motivation is for doing any of this, it's to get access to the students. Their goal is to be able to reach in and recruit the best students, and they want to know who they are. And so this was actually very motivational for companies in the area. So we had gold, silver, and bronze. The difference in the levels was, was very little. Um, a silver sponsor was gold less, the keynote speaker opportunity. And then the bronze was everything silver had um, less having a table, I think was the difference. And so in short, I did have enough money. I was able to raise money more than enough to hold my large kickoff event at our conference center. So the first week, of the semester, 
then moving forward, um, through the generosity of our sponsors, I will say we had this event and this is, this is what it looked like. It, I just loved this event. And so did our clients. About one third of our clients are return clients. And they were just amazed at the difference um, between going to a simple orientation and actually sitting down with their team. And so each one of these tables is a team. It's the students seated with their clients. And we had coached the students um, how to dress, um, prep them with questions. Of course, they have their, you know, their, their, um, the overview of their project with them. And so during the agenda of this evening, we talked about, of course, the semester and all the, the policies of the university. But to engage the team, we did a stakeholder identification and analysis workshop. So this was a learning for um, the clients as well as the students. So this took the place as one lecture for the students and the clients had no idea what a stakeholder register was. And so they became very involved then in discussion with their students on who all needs to be involved in this project. And so that kicked off the ball running. So students were equipped on their laptops with a stakeholder register that we fed to them earlier in the day and um, they were off and running. And so talk about the ultimate icebreaker, right? Now, the clients, here we are week one, this was on the first Wednesday night of the semester, the clients and the students have come together and they're working on their projects. It was awesome. And with that, we always adjourn with the celebration. Okay, this is actually a picture of one of my graduate school classes. Um, at the end of my graduate courses, I, we would walk, after their final presentations, we would walk across the street to the deer park and sit and eat and toast um, to the end of the semester. And so that's the end of my formal presentation and I'm happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know I took a lot of notes and got a lot out of that for mine and certainly something I, I teach mostly or uh, professional studies students. So it's a little bit different of an audience, but I think a lot yes. you can learn, right? Um, uh, more broadly, um, but let's, uh, let's open it up for uh, questions for Barb. We'll pivot to the panel in a few minutes, um, but let's see if there are any particular questions for Barb. Yeah, I do. I'll add, I do teach professional studies as well mm. in the evenings, so I'll field any of those questions as well. Great. Did you know that there was one chat that came in, Barb, while you were presenting? I did not see it. Errol, uh, and she was wondering if there were any of the templates you could share. Uh, seems like a, she said, seems like a great resource, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, they belong to the University of Delaware. It's their IP. Um, I can probably sanitize some of the undergraduate templates and send them to you. Yeah, I have a question for you, Barb. You know, one sure. of the um, one of the questions I think that comes to my mind is you've got you know a system that is thirty five years old. It's clearly got. Um, a lot of backing from you and others at the university. Um, it certainly takes a lot of time and work to set something like that up. Do you think that there are some of those things that you do that might, you know, maybe we're not lighting the world on fire when we start doing this, but maybe, maybe we kind of like one or two or three crucial things that we might be able to implement, implement um, for folks who don't have that level of support? Yeah, it's such a good question, Rich, because this did evolve over 30 years, right? And back then, the major didn't have 130 students. It was probably 15 or 20 students in the beginning. So it was much easier. So for anyone that has like one class with, you know, 20 or 30 students, start with one company. Um, and we've done this with other classes in Learner. Find one company, whether it's one of the bank or many other manufacturing or whoever companies in the area who's willing to come into the classroom and give you a project that's suitable for a semester and have all your teams work on the same project and perhaps it becomes a competition. And at the end of the semester, uh, the client, the students will present 
their findings and their results and their deliverables. And then the um, client has the opportunity to select a winning project or the one that they think creates the most value. But start with one, one project for the class and have all the teams work on the same project. That's, that's the way I would suggest um, breaking into it much more easily. It's much more manageable. Absolutely, thank you. Other mm -hmm. questions? Hi, uh, this is Frank Arte at uh, Barbara. Just a quick question. I, I, I'm always curious on, again, I've, I've been in, the, in project management 30 plus years. I'm, I'm one of those on the back end that are looking to, you know, maybe uh, I've taught a little bit at Penn State Abington and, and Brandywine, but I'm always interested on the career path. And, and you know, I, I'm one of those that said absolutely zero, right, when I first started that I would go into management only because it wasn't exposed. So, you talked about management information system students. What is that curriculum? It, it, like, what is at a high level, obviously, but like, how how do you see these students going into project management and, and what kind of foundations, PMP related foundations are taught in their curriculum? If, if you could maybe help there. The, okay, sure. Well, the only exposure they get to any kind of formal project management is in this capstone program. They don't okay. have any, unfortunately, they don't have any before this. Okay. Um, the, the MIS curriculum is a combination of business, analytics, a little bit of programming, just enough to understand like what web development is. They do some database work um, and a lot with, a lot with data analytics. Um, they use a lot of technical tools, um, data visualization tools and so forth to solve business problems. And so they get hired by all of the large firms into consulting roles, um, into implementation roles where they're, they have their own methodologies in place. And I've actually gotten uh, feedback from former students year over year how they were able to shine um, when they attended the training that was required for all the new hires, um, like from PwC, Ernest & Young, KPMG, and so forth. They would get immersed in a week of training in their project management and implementation methodologies before they would let them go out with the consultants you know, to a client's site. Um, and uh, they could shine because of this project experience. And so they felt very well prepared. Um, now, we have a lot of dual majors like MIS and accounting or MIS and finance, and they might go into accounting or audit roles um, because those roles require now um, analytical skills. They're not manual anymore. And it's all about manipulating data. And so um, quite a bit into um, audit or IT audit. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I see people coming on video, so maybe there are some other questions. Thank you, Frank. Oh, thank you, Frank. Both Franks. <laughs> All right. Well, let's um let's shift then. Uh, we'll shift into our panel. Um, we're going to go right into the panel. We had some discussion about it, and we thought rather than take a um, formal break, we would. Um, uh, transition right into it. If folks needed to step away, you can just step off video and take a break, but we didn't want to uh, get too much interruption in there. So uh, we'll really do this panel as uh, long as it lasts. We have some uh, prepared questions and also, um, you know, we want it to be pretty conversational. So, you know, we've got a re reasonable size group here. Feel free to um, come off mute and ask your question. What I'd like to do to start let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Um, what I'd like to do to start is just have each of our uh, panelists introduce themselves. Um, so you heard from Barbara. Um, I'll go through each of the panelists and you could just give a brief intro of yourself um, so that folks can uh, know who you are and where you're with and uh, what you're doing. So uh, Dr. Cheryl Mickens first. Hello everyone, my name is Sherelle Mickens and I am a senior project manager at Diamond Project Management. And we are a small um, consultation firm and our greatest strength is in the educational realm. 
I personally have served as a principal project manager for several school districts, as well as um, a project manager on a construction site in Nicaragua, which was just a life-changing experience for me. I'm very happy to be here with you all today and to learn and exchange information with all of you. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Maturla, are you on? I know we were having, and maybe I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, please correct me. <laughs> I am. Um... Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Tejasvi Matarla. I'm an assistant professor of project management at Penn State Abington. I teach both for Abington and also Brandywine because it's a shared program between our campuses. Um, I do teach project management, planning and resource management and portfolio management at our campus. Um, yeah, that's about it. Great. Yeah, it's a pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Um, Kevin Mayhew. Hi, I'm Kevin Mayhew. I Teach, uh, also teach at Penn State Abington. I uh, mostly teach uh, MIS. Um, so this was actually a really good presentation, Barbara. Thank you. Um, I also worked uh, for about 30 years, 25 to 30 years in project management uh, on the IT security and um, uh, side of things. Um, I still do some consulting on the side as well. Um, and I've been an active member of uh, PMI and PMI DVC since 2013, and I've been teaching at Penn State Abington for about five years. Great, thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least is uh, Dr. Lindsay Madison. Never seen so many people with the last name M on one panel. So it's like, <laughs> is that a requirement for the panel today? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm Dr. Lindsay Madison. I am the department head for business leadership, fashion, and hospitality at the Community College of Philadelphia. And under that department, is our project management proficiency certificate, which we actually just launched this past academic year as an effort to create a pathway and diversify the pipeline towards CAPM certifications and introducing project management to a subset that doesn't necessarily see it as a career path right now. My background is actually in event management and it wasn't until I started experience of people not really realizing they were project managers and coming into it. So thanks, thanks, Dr. Madison. That's great. Well, um, let's go ahead and just start the panel. We'll go right down the list in the same way we uh, introduce uh, our, ourselves. Um, if each panelist could, could just say uh, very briefly uh, one of the successes that they've experienced in the classroom um, with with bringing uh, real real world projects to the classroom. So just a real brief um, story. And and Barb, you can certainly start if you feel like you've shared it all. You can pass. But if you want to uh, highlight any particular experiences, that'd be great. I guess I, I would highlight um, how things come back full circle when the students have this kind of experience because. Um, what I instituted several years ago after um, we made all these changes to the program was an MIS capstone alumni panel. So because I had been reaching out to recent graduates and asking how they want to participate, they all wanted to come back and talk to the students and give time, but they had only graduated maybe within the last five years and didn't necessarily have you know, money to donate. But we put together an alumni panel of students who went through the program and then had them come back and talk about their careers and how that capstone program really helped them launch their careers. And that was so extremely valuable. It, was, it made such a difference to the students who were sitting in class so they could see how their skills would apply. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So having yeah. someone who can do that connection on the, on the back end and say, hey, this really makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah. see it necessarily in the moment. Okay, great. Um, let's uh, go over to Dr. Mickens. So um, my greatest success was having um, an opportunity to take practitioners in different areas of expertise and have them work on a project with me. So for example, when we did our project in Nicaragua, we had a lot of um, issues of reference to curriculum development and then irrigation systems and building a fence and building walls around this classroom. 
And so we brought in practitioners from different areas. We had engineers, we had educators, we had um, local leaders come in and help us with the project. And then as it turned out, these ex seven of our um, team members actually got hired as project managers in the country of Nicaragua because they brought their expertise from their specific area. But just like Dr. Madison said, um, they realized that they have been project managers mm -hmm. within their own area of expertise for so many years that they were just a natural fit in these different um, areas. So it was really exciting for me to see, you know, my dopey team that I brought together to just be experts in one specific area branch off into new career paths as project managers because they have been doing the job for so long. So that was my greatest takeaway. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Maturla. Um, yeah, so Kevin and I usually um, very frequently partner with our um, career um, and professional development office as well as um, alumni relations office. And we do bring in a lot of alumni members who are in project and supply chain management background. Uh, we've had some speakers from, just a minute. <laughs> My dog was just barking, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we did bring in a lot of uh, speakers from JB Hunt. We did bring in some from uh, Siemens. And of course, Ken always helps us with a lot of different, um, you know, webinar events. So we did try to bring in a lot of speakers who could come and talk to our students about different projects um, in manufacturing, healthcare, IT, um, supply chain. Uh, but other than that, I don't think we've had any projects in terms of collaborations where our students could work and we are potentially looking to do that. Um, so hopefully that will be in the works soon. Did uh, your colleagues steal all of your answers, Kevin, or did you want to? <laughs> no, she, she actually did not. <laughs> she, she forgot about all the case studies we do with. Um, and so that's, really where we've been really focusing a lot on uh, with companies. We, we, um, so we also have a, um, uh, we, we work um, in, uh, with the IST department. So we're in the business department. And so we work a lot with the IST department and we try to uh, get these case studies uh, with organizations. And we've been very successful in, in getting, uh, you know, two or three a semester, so well, you've it's been not doing really that. I wasn't, integrating. So that's why. <laughs> What's that? Well, you've been doing that. I wasn't, so that's why yeah. I didn't mention that. I was going to give you credit. <laughs> um, so yeah, we do a lot of um, a lot of that, and, and we're actually working now with uh, other colleges in the area to get other students and other colleges, and um, and also uh, international colleges, uh, to, and and working with organizations. Uh, to do that. I have also tried to reach out to some organizations to kind of do what Barbara talked about. Um, but as of yet, I have not been successful to, um, to get them, uh, you know, to, to take me up on, on my offer. I haven't made them an offer they couldn't resist yet. <laughs> so, but I'm working on it. So thank you. Yeah, maybe after Barb's presentation, you've got what you need to approach them again. So, <laughs> uh, Dr. Madison. So, for us, as a new program in a community college, our focus, our customer is ourselves. So, I look, I, we've approached project management as we're the customer and how do we promote project management and get students in. Uh, so, I had... Dr. Bonavara, unfortunately couldn't make the call today, but um, she actually teaches our, several of our project management courses. And so I pitched to her that her class would put together a student panel, so much like Barbara, except for this student panel, recognizing that students like to hear from students instead of just hearing from us old fogies all the time. And so putting a student panel together, but then they came up with the questions and put the panelists together and worked on that project from that approach. Um, and that's kind of how we, one of our biggest successes is just to give them an opportunity to do something internally so everybody wins, we're our own client and it benefits. Yeah, certainly, absolutely. Um, any uh, 
I, I can keep asking questions all day, um, but let me make sure uh, if anyone on the call has any questions for our uh, panelists. Okay, you'll make me do the hard work then. Um, let's go the opposite way. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Madison and work our way back up the list. Um, can you talk, uh, can you speak to the, maybe the barriers that um, you've experienced, right? So, you know, we just heard, and I think we always hear all of the amazing things and Barb just distilled into, you know, half an hour, all of the things that worked, although did share too, you know, when what happens when data sharing goes wrong, I guess. Um, it, you know, we know it's it's challenging, right? We have limited time. You know, some of us, like me, me for example, you know, I'm a, I'm a project manager, project management office director by day and adjunct professor by night and, you know, only have limited time. Um, so I certainly run into that as a barrier. Um, but, but any kind of barriers or challenges that you've faced and, and not, you know, necessarily barriers that you've solved, but maybe just barriers that you have, um, because I think that's okay to, you know, have in this space too. So we'll start with Dr. Madison and then go the opposite direction. Yes, our list of barriers is long. Um, <laughs> again, we're at a community college. Enrollment is terrible. And the first place that suffers enrollment is a community college, um, mm -hmm. particularly a minority serving institution. Mm -hmm. So that is a big challenge in and of itself. So we're trying to recruit students to a program that they don't know about. It's not just on the news. That, oh, I'm going to be a project manager. This is going to be great. That's what I want to do. So that is one barrier. The other is kind of a return on investment. So you we have an advisory council. It's great. Um, our, I should start by saying Project Management Institute, PMI was really involved in launching in our advisory council and getting a pr proficiency certificate started. And in that, so we have a lot of great outside companies like waiting for us to have students. And so you're like, I'd love to involve you. Thanks for sitting on the sidelines. I have five students in the class and maybe sometimes only three show up. So getting that return on investment to get industry in while also getting the students exposed to industry, but making it worthwhile because Rich, to your point, people are busy. So taking an hour to be like, I talked to you when one student, I don't know if that was really kind of worth it. Um, ma highly maximizing your time. So that's one of the barriers certainly are a myriad of barriers that we're facing. But some of these great ideas today I have written down and I will spend my summer <laughs> working on some of them as we incorporate them into our classes and get ready to graduate our first students from the certificate probably in the next spring at the rate we're going with classes. So report back. Yeah, no, please do. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? It's a fascinating time to be part of project management because every you know, job commercial that you hear nowadays is like, indeed, it's like, we're hiring project managers. And so I think that's definitely had an impact, at least in the classes that I teach at Villanova. And um, I, I also recently started at, at Wake Forest, which is not local, but doesn't really matter in, in uh, 2022. And they're starting their program as well. And there's just a, a, a ton of interest. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I'm hoping it ramps up and ramps up this committee and we're able to, you know, kind of keep, keep talking about that. So thanks. For yeah, that. that's, I would definitely say that's definitely one of the things that we've recognized is the ability to be agile to mm -hmm. project management terminology and recognize that our intended original audience, we're not reaching yet, but we're also getting a host of people from the great resignation or whatever else that are like, I want to do this and this is affordable and is fast. And so now we're looking at switching up course offerings. So we have seven weeks and they're going faster than the 15 week term. And you're getting through it at a pace that more senior adult learners, whether they're post-baccalaureate or masters are coming back and able to do. So that's some of our pivoting strategy as well. So barrier opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I, I can really kind of say the same uh, same thing. We're also a very new program. So I think this is our, we just finished our third year. Is that third year or fourth year? Fourth? Fourth year? Second, Tages? second, second. We just finished second. We are in the third year. Yeah, we're finishing up our third year though, right? No. We you really? In the fall. Did in the you fall. start February of 2018? 
No. I mean, uh, uh, fall of 2018? No. When did you start? 19. Oh, wow. It you seems are like really proving years. that COVID has messed with <laughs> Oh, my God. So anyways, we're, <laughs> we're new. So so we're a new project management uh, degree. So, um, you know, we've been, I guess it's only been two years. It seems like it's been long, oh, three, but. Um, and so, and then we also, you know, we're, we're just outside the city. So we, we are, we have a very diverse um, population. Um, and what we're really also focusing on, like, um, like we just shared that uh, students at 20 years old don't even know what the word project management means. Right. And so to get them to even enroll in the program um, and, and get them exposure to what their life could be um, has been a, a challenge. Um, and so that's really what we've been focusing on as well. Um, and then, um, you know, and then getting them, and especially at, at 20 years old, just even getting them to understand that, you know, in a year or two, they're actually going to have to work at a job um, is, is, you know, it's, it's just foreign to them because they just, they just don't understand it. So, um, <laughs> so that's some of the, the challenges. And then the whole COVID was, is a real big challenge for us. Um, because our campus, I mean, campus was, even after we came back, it was still locked down. Um, it's really just opened up like this semester to where there was possibilities we could bring people on campus um, because even last semester, uh, it was still, uh, they did not want people, um, you know, coming on campus. And so, um, so that's been, you know, challenged to even try to get this off the ground. So. That's it. Yeah, so to add on to that, I mean, of course we are a new program and um, it has been because of the COVID, it has been difficult to recruit students and retain them. Um, we have students that will switch majors, um, you know, depending on how difficult a particular, you know, major is. So that's, that's one thing that's, you know, has been a challenge and also, we do have, I mean, we are also a majority minority serving institution. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot of traditional and non-traditional students. We get adult students who are in the 50s, 60s, but also we get traditional students. Uh, but at the same time, most of them have a job already. I mean, working a part-time job or sometimes they work, you know, two of them um, and just making it to the classes, you know, it, it's just very challenging for them for their, you know, backgrounds and how their home situations are. So making them work on a lot of different projects can be challenging at some times, if, especially if it's a long duration project, you know, a semester long or even half semester where they have to spend a lot more time doing something that can be a challenge. Um, I mean, even when we want to introduce certain new programs or bring in speakers, of course, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of protocols and, um, you know, anyone can shut you down based on what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And it's just going through and jumping those hoops. Like, I guess that's that's very difficult because when we started having conversation with Ken about uh, just being involved with the PMI and bringing in speakers, we initially started out with an idea that we would start a student chapter and make them get enrolled, um, you know, get the student membership, get their CAPM certifications. And that has been very difficult. I have a couple of students that have taken the CAPM and, you know, they have their student membership. I have a few others who do have the student membership, but... I don't know if they will be taking the CAPM certification or not. So, you know, there are plenty of things that we need to think about, especially when it comes to the money and the procedures that we have to follow. Yeah. So I would say just following the procedures is a bit more challenging even with the COVID as well. Thank you, Dr. Mickens. So I think some of the barriers that I face include um, leadership, resources, or the lack thereof. Um, rules are often a barrier. Past practice and cultural norms can be barriers as well. And then um, there are the relics that 
become a um, barrier as well. And when I say relics, I mean like, you know, things have worked a certain way for so many years. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's not really pulling our academic environment into this new um, realm of um, into the future, really, and moving forward. So, um, so those are some of the barriers that I face as an educator. But I want to just add, if I can, Rich, and you let me know if I'm going beyond the scope of this conversation. Bring it on. <laughs> but what, but my role in the Delaware Valley PMI chapter is the director of the Education and Social oh, Impact yeah. Committee. And one of our responsibilities is to bring the concept of project management to people within the age group of five to 35 years old. And so what I'm hearing from all of you educators is that we don't have a client base, but that's my role is to help develop a client base for you so that kids coming out of high school and people transitioning from um, one career to maybe another can really have access to what project management is and what different colleges and universities have to offer as far as a, um, a program of coursework is for these um, for this category of, of people. So I'm real excited to see that there is a need and that my role really is an important one. So I would love to collaborate with all of you. I'd like to get all of your um, contact information at a later time where we can really um, put our heads together and I can start channeling my efforts to lead, you know, a group of high school students. Maybe they could come and spend a week at um, the Community College of Philadelphia and tour the campus and I can run some programs, but at the same time, they're meeting, you know, Lindsay could drop in and explain what her, pro what her program is like and some experienced project managers could come in and say, hey, this is what I do all day. All I do is plan events and I love it. I don't have to be an expert in any particular realm. I just have to be a great project manager to um, meet with success. And the same with all the other um, professors and educators who are on this call. So um, thank you for asking me to be a panelist because now I really see a focus that I can develop into um, something else and be a resource for all of you. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think we need to do, it sounds like from this panel, we need to do some education around what project management really is, right? That's a lot of part of um, project management. I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my wife continues to ask me like, what is it really that <laughs> like you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? How about you, Barb? Um, I, I just wanna, and on, I would look forward to being involved in that discussion because there are some great teaching techniques that involve things like jelly beans and Legos to teach project management concepts. And they're so simple and enjoyable for actually students of all ages. So um, yeah, I, I would have a couple of suggestions there for that type of- Thank interview. you so much. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Um, barriers, for, for me, I'm gonna add leadership because leadership does not recommend recognize project management as uh, a discipline within the university environment. It's, it's kind of more of a necessary evil. And I, I was always hoping to introduce a new project management course earlier in their four year cycle. So they could apply it because our whole program is ex experiential and they do a lot of projects uh, throughout their four years. And um, I, I could never get that through. I could never get the addition of a, a new course introduced into the curriculum because there's such a rippling effect and there's so many requirements and who's gonna take it, who's gonna pay for it. Do we have to move things around? And, um, it got complicated. So it just got mixed. Um, but yeah, does it, does it live in business or engineering or IT or where is it? And, and it's all kind of growing up in a different way. And I have the experience actually I was an absolutely not on Ken's poll. I have the same experience be, because, you know, I took project management as an undergrad. It, it was an elective in my M MIS course. Georgetown calls it or called it operations and information management. Mm -hmm. And now they call mm -hmm. it um, 
operations and analytics, I think, or something, you know, it's kind of evolving in that way, right? That's the, you know, for the folks who maybe are less familiar with the MIS major, it's really like non-technical people who can look at data, but also use Excel yeah. and like figure out stuff. <laughs> that's that's my very like non-academic way of describing it. But um, yeah, I took my first project management course and I was like, what is this? I don't even, you you don't, if you don't have the frame of reference for working, as Kevin Kevin said, I think, you just don't have a, a frame of reference and it, and it doesn't, it almost doesn't make sense or it doesn't, it doesn't click. So yeah. um, let's Can I just, go ahead. Can I just yes, jump in on that. So one of the things I, I did in, in, in the uh, intro to MIS class, I do a whole, I just added a week of what is project management? Cause that's a, that's a class that students take in their first, um, uh, first year or their first semester of their second year. And so at least it exposes them that at that point, we have the same, uh, same thing. Our actual project management uh, class is not until like their junior year. Right. Uh, but so what I, I just added it to, the intro class to just at least make them aware of that. So, yeah, when especially, I mean, I guess it's true of any industry, right? We can all get so like, you know, take that for granted because we're in it, in it day in and day out. So that's a good reminder for me in my classes to be like, hey, everyone, this is what we're doing. Um, let's, uh, you know, I, I I think we have plenty of time, so we can obviously keep going, but. Uh, you know, there haven't been tons of questions in the in the chat. I don't want to, I, I want to end at where everyone feels like they're getting a lot out of this. So I wanted to go back through, start at the top again. Uh, we're sneaking back and forth and start with, with um, Barb and just uh, have our panelists add, you know, either um, just one other thing that they thought of while others were talking that they wanted to share with the group or uh, one particular action item and takeaway that they would recommend um, uh, for the folks listening today or the folks who are listening to the recording. So we'll start with Barb. I guess I would recommend start small, again, with maybe one company, one project, and apply it to the whole class, um, divide up the class into teams, and maybe have that client pick the most value-adding project at the end of the semester. Um, so it's not too stress stressful and you're not spending a lot of time trying to hunt down projects and clients throughout the year. Um, but it's very, very doable. And I'm more than willing to speak with anybody outside this meeting who, you know, wants to collaborate further on bringing in projects. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Minkins. I would say, um, don't forget about social media. Every um, department or class should develop a social media resource page where you advertise your project management mm -hmm. courses and classes. And, you know, Ken, I don't know if Ken's still on this call, but Ken developed this great um, soundbite system where it's like, you know, he talks to these 11 professionals. I'm sure you can snag some of those sound bites. So I hope you can work with Ken to get some of that information and use it on your project management um, social media page for your college or university and um, see where it leads you as a great resource. Um, can I jump in and answer that? Um, mm -hmm. The I, I have six of those sound bites on the um, PMI DVC education YouTube channel. So everybody is welcome to go to YouTube and find them and use them. Okay. Get I'm going to here. I'm going to interject yeah. that we would hope you would become a member of our chapter as well. Thank you. Um, okay, Dr. Maturla, the, the Penn State Abington crew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think when we started uh, collaborating with Ken, we, we did try to figure out which universities actually offered project management as a degree itself and try trying to just develop a list of um, universities and the instructors that do teach. I think that was that was a bit of a challenge to figure out who actually teaches those courses. I mean, just to have a reference in terms of who teaches, who we can collaborate with, how we can share um, any of the resources that we may have, any templates or presentations. 
Um, I think it would definitely help if we can have something like a Google Drive or a Box uh, account where we can put in all the information that we are allowed to share, maybe the material that uh, we don't mind sharing uh, with other instructors and collaborators, that would be great. Um, and also, I, oh, this is one thing that we've been trying, but it would be great because we do offer project and supply chain management and we do have plenty of students now. We are growing um, as a major and we would you know, love to have at least one industry mentor assigned to each of these students that are in the major where they can talk about um, different opportunities, projects, maybe help some get some of the job search advice, just regular mentorship maybe having a list of PMI DVC members who can actually, or who are actually willing to help our students, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we can definitely speak about at our um, academic council meeting. Um, you know, I'm in just, a, you know, in the interest of connecting and focusing that I do, I'm in healthcare. So happy to talk about healthcare. You know, if we, we should, we should figure out a way to do that. I like the Google Drive. I like the way of sharing volunteerism. Ken might have some thoughts about that, or maybe that's something we need to talk about at another event. Especially, I feel like as we get to these, um, you know, to Barb's point of starting small, maybe we start with the, you know, shared folder. Yeah. But as we start to be able to network more and better in a, you know, in-person setting, um, maybe that gets us to where we're going to. But we'll keep that on our on our roadmap. That's one thing I can I can think about for sure. Thanks, that's a great idea. Am I up? You're up. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was, but I didn't have the list in front of me. Um, so uh, what I was just kind of thinking is, is also um, something that just happened to me personally, is you, you just never know where you're going to run into contacts to kind of help your students. Um, and so, um, I actually have become very friendly uh, with uh, this woman that is responsible for a global um, outreach for a, um, a consulting company at the dog park. And so, um, and so I've been working with her and, and trying to get her, you know, um, to come to campus and, and things like that. So um, you know, so I liked what Barbara said about starting small. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, one, the other, when Barbara was actually talking, thinking, uh, talking about that, I was thinking, yeah, it's just kind of like being a project manager. You just kind of break it down and, into a small component and, and then build upon that. So, so I just wanted, you know, wanted to share that, you know, for me, like it was just a fluke. She actually had an MIS degree. I teach MIS, so we started talking at the dog park. Her dog and my dog get along, and they play a lot together, and it just kind of grew from that. And she was actually at another company when we met, and so she turned. She's made my, you know, gave me the connection to that company, and now I, you know, I'm connected with her at this this company and stuff. So you never know. I mean, it, it's just we're her and I are just trying to like get something going and stuff like that. So, um, so I guess my point is just be open to, you know, weird situations that can happen that, that can kind of help in, in these situations. So that's what my last thought. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, no, thanks. I'm going to start, I'll be accosting folks on the SEPTA now. You know, you never know <laughs> when you're going to find someone. That's great. Thank you. Grocery stores, dog yeah. parks, whatever. I'll run <laughs> handout cards. All right, Dr. Madison. So one of the things I've taken away from this conversation, and I teach hospitality management, and so one of the things that I've found successful is when there's a networking event, even if I just take one student with me, that they feel comfortable, they network, and they get out. And so applying that approach with PMI, I also just realized I'm not even a PMI member. I'm working on fixing that. I just got my tax exempt status so I can pay with the school's credit card and get it taken yes. care of. And then my plan this summer is to sit for the CAPM. And so we're making progress. We're making progress um, <laughs> on that front. Um, but really just being able to take students to a chapter meeting or a networking event and being like, bring one with you. And then they get an experience and then they tell it um, to their classmates and their peers. And so that's one takeaway and reminder that I didn't realize I wasn't a PMI member. So it's not my fault. I thought I 
And it apparently never did. So well, we're glad we put you on the panel. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is terrible. You can't sit on someone's panel and not be a member. So fix that. No, we're pretty, we're pretty open group. Um, <laughs> are there any other questions from our uh, folks attending um, for our great panel today? Hi, this is Frank. Not necessarily a question, but again, uh, kudos to uh, uh, colleagues at, at Brandywine in, uh, in Edmonton. So I, I taught for three or four years uh, project management and risk management and the PMP certificate program is a very, very good touch point for these students. Um, so keep that, keep that up. You know, I've been a, again, 30 plus years in the field, um, you know, mechanical engineering degree. So I went the technical route, but the common theme I'm seeing here is the soft skills, right? So when I was teaching, I would focus on the soft skills because you, you can always be a project management manager without the technical expertise. You just got to be able to listen and be confident and communicate, right? Um, so I, I think if, if anything, right, focus on soft skills um, and, and the students are very receptive to it, right? So, um, and especially now, right, where we're doing more, less face-to-face -face and more virtual, it even accelerates the need for the soft skills. So, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 in my heart, I love what I did for, do for a living. I want to keep doing it, but we got to get, um, we got to get uh, this, 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 this career. Like it's not a known career, and we got to keep driving that down to these these folks in their twenties, Kevin, right? That may not even be aware of this, and they they may not jump into it. Uh, last comment is, I think the folks that are more willing to make a change are in their latter or just starting off their career. So late twenties, early thirties is what I saw when I was teaching the folks that are make that shift uh, towards that project management career, not necessarily fresh out of school. So if we can win latter versus more earlier, I think that's the balance as educators, you guys need to focus on, you know, but again, thank you for, uh, I just happened to see this Richard and it's been great. So uh, thanks for, uh, reaching out. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, just a fabulous discussion, I, I feel like, and something that hopefully folks can refer back to. And, you know, we're always open to ideas. So anything that comes up, uh, we do these events twice a year. Um, we're developing a calendar. I'm kind of trying to get into the cadence of supporting um, folks in <clears throat> who are teaching project management in the greater Philadelphia region. So if there's anything that this group can do, whether it's these events or other events or, you know, whatever, please reach out to me. Um, I would be glad to uh, speak with you and uh, start to kind of move the ball forward. And, you know, I, I love her to kind of move the ball forward. And, you know, I, I love the project management attitude of these groups of folks. We're going to try to do um, uh, little things, build systems, build on top of them. You know, we all have full-time jobs. We're not, you know, I'm we're not going to start suddenly doing this and, and light the world on fire, but maybe this can be a really good group for us to network and connect and share resources and move forward. So we'll we'll certainly do that. And I, I just want to thank our really extraordinary panel once again. Lots of great ideas and enthusiasm in the room, and especially uh, Barbara for your presentation this morning. I think it was really thorough, and there's a lot of things that folks can take away from it. So thank you very much, everyone. My pleasure. Great. All right. Well, uh, without uh, further ado, we, I always like to get time back as a project manager. So, um, Richard, there's a hand raised. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, I believe oh, no, it was we're just Mark. clapping. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was clapping. Oh, oh, Although okay. I did that at the end of a meeting the other day, I raised my hand as like 40 people were trying to leave. And they said, Rich, do you have a question? I was like, no, go. Get out of here. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thanks, everyone. It's such a pleasure. Uh, we'll, we'll all be in touch. And uh, please talk outside of this meeting. And uh, glad you remember now, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Shameful. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.